things are about um, the question I was about to ask in Georgia right now. What's the state of the affairs there? It's a it's a hand it's a hand recount. Is that part of a limited audit? Is that part of a canvas, or is that part of a formal uh, other procedure? So what the Secretary of State publicly stated was that he was going to do all three at once: uh, a an audit, a recanvas, and a recount as part of their risk limiting audit protocols and procedures, which was within his inherent discretion to order prior to his office certifying the election. Unfortunately, it does not appear that is what has in fact occurred. So what is in fact, uh, uh, hold on a second. <laughs> this is what I believe is referred to as boomer moments from based on the comment section. Um, okay, we'll let, we'll let Robert come back in. <laughs> This is going to be one heck of a podcast for anybody listening to it, only the audio and not actually knowing what on earth is going on. But yeah, exactly. I mean, they were talking about thor thoroughbred horses. I have no idea how anything I said triggered thoroughbred horses. The uh, uh, Maybe there's some folks listening in who did that. Uh, you know, I'll leave, leave that to people's imagination. The uh, So, yeah, I mean, there, there's a protocol and procedure here that it, it, he publicly announced he was going to do. Uh, which I was very glad to see. And I, and I was hopeful that Georgia would be the example for the rest of the country in these contested states where it's very, very close. You know, let's, let's use these great procedures and protocols that we've produced with experts and bipartisan consensus over 20 years to instill confidence in the outcome, whichever outcome that may be. Uh, I mean, I've been, for people who don't know, I've been part of election litigation almost 20 years and have been pushing for this for often independent third-party candidates, but also for whenever it's a contested race. Let's use something that everybody can say, I feel confident in this outcome, even if they don't like who the winner may be declared to be. Uh, and so he initially announced that. He said in his public statements, you can look it up in CBS and elsewhere, he said, I'm going to do all three, a recount, a recanvas, and an audit as part of his risk-limiting audit process. And that's a manual recount of all the ballots. Uh, in, in Georgia. Now, in Georgia, ballots were cast in two ways, either uh, a handwritten ballot sent in by mail, or if you went and voted in person, it was done by a machine that printed out a ballot and you put the ballot in. And so as part of this, wanted to make sure that, you know, the I, I hope to see that the number of votes match the number of voters, make sure there was no, you know, uh, unusual duplicates or anything like that taking place, that the vote count was correct, the machine didn't uh, overcount something or undercount something. Uh, also wanted to make sure the signature check was actually enforced because all across the country, there has been an, a his, even though we had a historically unprecedented number of mail-in ballots, five to six times the norm, sometimes even 10 times what has been previously done in a state or county, we're seeing a rejection rate that is historically low, that is 10 to 20 times below the norm. So maybe it's the case that the that all these ballots don't have a single problem with them, and that the signature check uh, signature check would be fine. But the best way to do that is to have an independent observer monitor the signature check, see it. Okay, there's the voter registration signature. There's the election signature. My understanding is a lot of these states have digitized these records, so it's not that complicated. I mean, it, it could be time consuming, but not terribly time consuming, um, it, given the nature and the consequence of this election. But it appears that none of the counties are doing that in Georgia. So in fact, it appears that's not happening anywhere in the country. It appears that the, the, the singular request that could really resolve a lot of concerns uh, is the very request that they are refusing to grant any county anywhere in the country. And, and just so people appreciate this is that there was, I don't know what how many times more mail-in ballots this election than in previous elections for obvious reasons. Um, and apparently, yeah, the rejection rate of the mail-in ballots now was something like 10 times lower than in every other previous election where there had been 10 times less mail-in ballots. And the question is why? Now, the question of cross-checking the signatures on the ballot to the signature cards, uh, I think there might be some confusion here. I have a bit of confusion. I've been reading that there's a signature on the envelope and a signature on the ballot, but that wouldn't make any sense in terms of cross-checking mm -hmm. because that would be one yeah. and the same element. There's a signature card that all mail-in ballots have to be cross-checked with in theory? Yeah. So what it is, is almost all the voter registration files have one of, they usually have multiple signatures on file for you. So for example, they usually have your driver's license signature on file. Uh, you have a lot of motor voter states. Uh, they called it motor voter because when you got your driver's license, you were automatically registered to vote in some states. So they'll usually have your registration, uh, uh, your, your uh, 
Well, they'll have your voter registration. Say when you registered, if you registered separately, they'll have that signature on file. They'll usually have your driver's license signature on file. Sometimes they'll have other signatures on file, such as when you may have requested an absentee ballot application, you may have signed the application. They may have that signature on file. So they usually have multiple signatures on file and people can look it up. The state of Colorado, the secretary of state's office put out a very practical guidance for how you can interpret the signatures, only 20 pages long. Anybody can learn it in about an hour. And most of us have practical experience with this. I mean, the, the signatures matter. Signatures should matter as much in your vote to match as it is if someone was trying to draw money on your bank account that had your signature on a check if it wasn't your signature. So uh, bank tellers do this every single day. Uh, so this is not some kind of like crazy esoteric science. It's a pretty basic thing and they do it. I have a lot of experience doing it, representing clients who submit petitions to get on the ballot or a referendum to add to the ballot in those states where that's allowed or initiative. And there they, they uh, uh, have applied uh, signature requirements basically every election cycle because there's someone that's trying to get on the ballot or there's an initiative or referendum effort afoot in most states in the country. And the election officials are very accustomed to checking signatures. Now I can tell you that that signature check rate usually results in about a 20% rate of not match of the signature not matching the signature on file. They have always been much more liberal and generous when it comes to absentee ballots, which I always found a little peculiar. It's like, why is it just trying to get on the ballot? Your a signature match has to be strictly enforced. But when it's an actual ballot, somehow the standard should be far less. I, I never understood that. But putting that aside, the norm has been at least two to three percent of absentee ballots are rejected for not matching signatures. And as the number of people dramatically increase that do absentee balloting, the concern of fraud and other issues has led to things like in New York and New Jersey, when they increase the number of ballots, uh, absentee ballots, the signature problems increased, not declined. And in fact, there, people can look it up. There's a New York Times article in 2012, which went into great detail about the great risks associated with absentee balloting, especially as it increased, because it was has always been, in the last hundred years, the number one source of election fraud. Uh, and in part, that's because when you go and vote in person, you're, you're, you are in a safe, secure location. You can cast your ballot in secret with no coercion or fraud. And you are usually checked in some manner. In, in Georgia, you have to show your photo identification. In other states, they have other me uh, methods of checking you. Maybe your date of birth, maybe your address, maybe something else. But you have to do it physically there in person. People observe you doing it. And so the risk that your ballot is coerced or is fraudulent or is purchased or anything else is substantially reduced. So just that risk by itself created risk with absentee balloting. That risk is not even addressed really by the signature match. The signature match just makes sure you're the one who actually filled in that ballot. And the concern is that with lots of ballots flying around and being sent out everywhere, you had a, basically a bunch of blank checks. Uh, and you don't want people cashing that check who weren't the authorized person. Yeah. <clears throat> and, but it appears that uh, there was a lot of litigation in the summer uh, and in some in 2019 in a bunch of states that was meant to discourage secretaries of state from actually enforcing the signature match, uh, even though the legislatures passed no laws amending that. And there, there's something called the electors clause. And that just goes back to the state legislature determines the rules for the presidential election. And it can't be determined outside of court, outside of the legislature by say, a private agreement between a secretary of state okay, and so some other people. This is the perfect segue. Now I'm gonna remember the minute, 40 minutes. Ellen Woods filed, uh, L. Linwood filed a lawsuit in Georgia, and it basically, I'll, I'll summarize my understanding of the proceedings, because it does refer back to this uh, settlement agreement between private actors and the government. So L. Linwood's lawsuit, essentially, if I'm not mistaken, it's a 14th Amendment lawsuit. Um, the essential allegations are that um, Georgia had set out a procedure for mail-in voting. Uh, there was a lawsuit, I forget who it was, but it was a Democratic Party that had sued uh, the government, and the government entered into a settlement agreement, which they call the transaction or whatever, whereby the verification of the signatures on the ballots in the event that there was an issue would be subject to some sort of panel verification of not one poll ballot counter person, uh, but rather three. And this deviated from the legislative uh, rules governing 
how to resolve uh, an issue with the signature on the ballot. This was a private settlement agreement entered into between, I don't, I forget what it was, the Georgia Democratic Party and the government, which otherwise altered the, the, the legislation as to how to do it. So the basis of the lawsuit that Ellen Wood has filed now, um, it is basically not treating votes equally, I think, as, as the base constitutional question. Uh, in joining certification of Georgia's electoral college, college votes until they remedy the issue, and what else was there in terms of the conclusions? I think I got. I think I got the essence of it. Really, it's bo the bottom line is that there was a s private settlement agreement entered into in uh, subsequent to litig a litigation that altered the law as relates to verifying signatures on the ballots, and might explain why it was basically. From what I understand, virtually none of the of the signatures were invalidated. So you have basically record low levels of disqualification of ballots, which gives more weight to certain votes than to others. I, I, I is that accurate enough? So yeah, if, if effectively his claim is twofold. It's an equal protection violation on the grounds that there was discriminatory treatment between different groups of voters. So that, for example, in Georgia, if you vote in person, you have to produce photo identification. Uh, and if you're voting early, you also sign in. Whereas if you voted by mail, you did not have to produce photo identification. You could just sign. Or in some cases, you could produce photo identification without it being in person and not sign in terms of the absentee ballot application itself. And then with the absentee ballot, the only check on making sure that this person is who they, the person who cast the vote is the qualified voter listed on the file, was a signature match against what was, uh, would be uh, otherwise unknown information. The theory is that someone couldn't fake. We talked about this uh, back when, before the election, when I got two ballots in Nevada and Las Vegas, what prevents me from just sending both back in? Take it, well, take it as if one gets annulled. I mean, other than potential criminal sanctions, someone's going to say, you're not going to do it because you can get prosecuted for mail or, you know, for voter fraud. You might you know, say, oh, I forgot that I mailed one in here. But other than other than criminal prosecution, if enough people just take their chances and if it gets disqualified, so be it. And if it doesn't, hey, it's two votes. Uh, exactly. And, and the, the check was supposed to be, uh, well, they're going to check the signature and I couldn't possibly know what this other person's signature was on file on their driver's license or voter registration file. So that that would be a check. They would catch that. The uh, Las Vegas registrar made the promise that, hey, we'll catch these. Well, a reporter in Las Vegas actually tested it out. He had people send in nine uh, fake forged versions of his signature. that were uh, obviously fake. They missed eight of the nine. So the, that gives you an idea of what was happening in Las Vegas. And the question is, was this happening everywhere? And at least from the low rate of rejection, the, the inference is that something happened, either everybody uh, somehow got perfect signatures or uh, something happened uh, that in the signature match process. And in Georgia, the issue that arose was this consent decree signed by the Secretary of State in 2019 that created a cumbersome bureaucratic process if you were actually going to reject a signature that may have led to counties saying, you know, this isn't worth the hassle we're just going to approve signatures unless it's unless there's no signature. Um, and they also had a notice and cure process whereby if a voter's ballot was rejected, they were given the opportunity to produce identification and say, yes, that was me and here's my signature. And if uh, I'm, I'm not mistaken, according to the lawsuit, that procedure was only applied in certain counties th th that were more Democrat leaning than Republican counties. Is that one of the elements of the lawsuit as well? That's in Pennsylvania. Okay. So the uh, so in each state you have your own issues, but a lot of them revolve around two major problems. One that the signature match process doesn't seem to have been enforced. In some contexts, that's a witness requirement in Wisconsin, in Michigan, in Pennsylvania, in Nevada, and in Georgia, it's the voter themselves. And the second is lack of observation, lack of transparency. The recommended rules and procedures by the best practices guides from the Blue Ribbon Commissions and the bipartisan committees has been to make sure there's more transparency so people can watch the process and have faith in it. Unfortunately, such as in Georgia, there had been a request made to observe the signature matching process. It was denied. So the uh, they said originally they would grant it, and then the way in which they granted it made it impractical. In other words, you couldn't see what was happening. Uh, I think people have been commenting on that publicly in Georgia 
they're seeing people count ballots and the people that are supposed to be monitoring it are so far away from the table, they can't possibly see what, what vote they're validating and to see right. what they're voting. And, and just to push back on that in terms of raising the argument, the counter argument that was stated in the lawsuit we're going to get to in a bit, Michigan, they said, okay, they were not allowed within six feet to see, but they had screens showing what was going on. Having not seen those screens, I don't know if it's totally impractical, totally useless, or totally illusory to pretend that that was any sort of meaningful verification. But that will be the counter argument that you're going to hear. What is the response to that? They had screens, they could see it on a big screen. So people can go, at least in the Georgia context, and they've been live streaming. Some of the counties have been live streaming. And you can see that, they're, that what you're seeing on video, you can't see the ballot at all. So the point of the monitoring isn't just to say, oh, look, this person's claiming to be counting something. <laughs> the, the purpose of the, of the monitoring is, are they properly interpreting voter intent on that ballot? Now, obviously, in the computer printout of ballots, that's really not going to be an issue. But in the issue of the hand filled out ballot, that's where it could become an issue. So you, you have situations where people do a check mark or other things where the machine might have recorded a ballot, but when you look at it, 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 it was improperly concluded. The whole point is, this was the debate in Bush v. Gore, what interprets voter intent? And the goal is to have somebody observing it that says, that's a fair interpretation, or hey, I object, let's have this process go through because I see a problem with this particular ballot. And again, it's all about transparency and confidence in the system. And it's unfortunate that you know people spent 20 years building these great rules and procedures and best practices to see them continually ignored in all of these jurisdictions is really unfortunate. Okay, so now I know we know how you feel about L. I'm saying L. If people think I'm saying Ellen Wood, L. Lynn Wood. Uh, we know we the other issues with Rittenhouse and whatever. Uh, the, the lawsuit seems, um, by comparison to the other lawsuits that I've read. Seems well drafted. It seems uh, it's clear in that I read it. It's it's shortish. Like I think it was thirty some odd pages. Um, it's concise. It's well structured, and it's it's clear enough for people to understand without getting into the nitty gritty. Overall, I mean, how do you feel about the lawsuit, and what's going to be the procedure? Like, how quickly can these lawsuits be heard, given the upcoming uh, December fourteenth deadline? So across the jurisdictions, you have a suit in Michigan in state court, a suit in Michigan in federal court. You have a at least one suit in Pennsylvania federal court. You might have multiple now and suits pending in Pennsylvania state court. Uh, and uh, I'm not I, I think there's a recount request in Wisconsin. There may also now be a suit in Wisconsin. In Georgia, there are multiple suits pending. So there's Lynn Wood suit filed in the Northern District of Georgia pending in the Atlanta division. There is another suit that's been filed in the Savannah division. Um, in fact, the same local Georgia council is involved with both. There's a, a lawyer from uh, outside the state that's involved in the Savannah case uh, asking for different remedies based on anomalies that have been spotted. The issue in the Lynn Wood case is a combination of equal protection and the electors clause <clears throat> because the argument is the state legislature is the only one that can amend the law governing signature matches. Uh, and the, the for people on the uh, you may not understand how equal protection applies in this context. It's your vote. You, you have a right to your vote being counted and that your method of voting shouldn't lead to them being where you happen to be within a state, you know, which county you happen to reside in, uh, shouldn't, oh, and your method of voting shouldn't lead to a discriminatory, differential, disparate treatment of you. In addition, you have a right against vote dilution. So any method of voting that allows or opens the door for fraud to occur dilutes the votes of those honestly cast. And it's, it's, it's a good line. I heard it somewhere where, you know, one line is, uh, not counting votes is voter suppression. I saw someone respond on Twitter that says counting illegal votes is voter suppression because you dilute the legal votes. Uh, and I see legal as in legitimate versus illegitimate votes, the ones that should get disqualified, the ones that might have been cast you know, by someone who's not a resident. So the, the the flip argument to suppressing the vote or not getting not counting votes is voter suppression, counting illegitimate ballots is also voter suppression. Um, Sorry, I cut you off there. Go, go Yeah, on. no problem. In fact, the California courts have referred to illegal votes as any vote not lawfully cast. It doesn't even require fraudulent intent. It just means a vote, like let's say a vote that did not arrive in time, a vote that did not meet certain protocols and procedures for being lawfully cast. Uh, so it doesn't require even fraud to have occurred. Um, and so the so, so that's where the scope of the litigation is. They're, they have requested different remedies to different courts. 
Uh, and the hard part with all of these cases is, in my view, the Secretary of State, if they stepped into the breach and the local county registrars or election officials or superintendents or election boards, as the case may be, if they'd stepped into the breach and said, hey, let's make sure we have a transparent, open process. Let's have a manual recount where the, it's monitored and observed. Let's have people review the signatures so people can see, yes, the signatures do match uh, if that's the case. Uh, let's make sure the votes add up to the voters. Let's make sure there's no machine or software issue. That is where our system is designed to work. When the secretaries of state don't do their job or when the election officials don't do their job is when problems occur. And the difficulty there is that both courts and Congress, who are the legal remedial powers that be in the presidential elector context, in, including theoretically the electors themselves, uh, the putting them into the into stepping in or stepping up has historically not always been a very effective remedy. And I think that if they don't step, instead they they sort of create massive pressure for people to just concede. Uh, and walk away. And I, I think a lot of the pressure to do that is, is a mistake. It's not going to lead to confidence, uh, even if a concession occurred. It's not, you know, there's going to be millions of Americans who rightfully wonder why certain basic elementary steps could not be taken to verify the vote. Well, I mean, it's, it's like I, you're pressuring someone to concede who has 70 now, what's, what's Trump up to? Regardless of what the difference is, 75 million people voted for him. And 75 million people did not vote so that he could concede under pressure of the media and whatever apparatus has been against him for the last four years in the presence of all of these things might be totally coincidental. They might be exaggerated. There might be some false, uh, uh, what's what I'm looking for controversy, like maybe with Sharpie gate lawsuit, which may have been unfounded, but you have people who are smelling a lot of, of fishiness and would not take kindly to that, to someone saying, okay, well I concede and you know, thanks for your vote. So, it's, it's true. Like the, the the lack of transparency in this entire process, given the given the margins, it's not like if the margins were greater, maybe you know you could get away with people um, accepting the results more easily. When the margins are less than one percent in five battle or four battleground states, um, and in some places minuscule amounts, given the five million votes cast, you don't you have to have more transparency. And when you have more uh, aversion to more transparency, people get more, um, they get more nervous about it. The, I guess, it was, so one, it was, someone asked a question about curing the ballots. The curing the ballots was in the Pennsylvania lawsuit, right? Correct, because it depends on the state. Uh, over the last several years, they've been, uh, the mostly people aligned with the Democratic Party have been bringing suits, challenging striking of absentee ballots on the grounds that there should be an opportunity to cure. My own view is I have a little bit of, you know, I have mixed sentiments on that subject. You know, the, my view is that more in-person voting is better and safer. And anything that encourages that should be incentivized. And that absentee balloting should be discouraged uh, to the scope that it invites voter coercion, voter fraud, vote purchases. Uh, it, it's just, it's always been problematic. I mean, the whole point of having an Australian ballot, which is what the secret ballot came from Australia, so we call it the Australian ballot, is completely gutted when you're not voting in a secure, safe polling place under supervision, where, the, where your ballot is actually secret. Absentee ballots are not secret by definition because you don't know wh where they cast that ballot, whether they were the ones who cast that ballot, whether someone purchased their ballot, whether someone intimidated them to do the ballot. In fact, the New York Times article called it uh, granny farming, where people go to nursing homes and get a bunch of ballots that they don't even know that they're signing, who they're signing for. So my own view is that making it easier to do absentee balloting is making it easier for voter fraud and voter coercion to take place. But putting that aside, the, a bunch of states basically were threatened with litigation and a, and a bunch of them changed their laws or agreed to consent decrees where, whereby they agreed to basically allow someone to have a chance to cure if their ballot was rejected. And so the uh, and so, I, again, I have mixed feelings. I, I want a voter's vote to count and not be improperly rejected, but I want voters to also be encouraged to vote in person because that's the best way to solve that problem the, uh, uh, rather than voting by mail. But uh, so the, in Georgia, they have that. In other states, they did. Now, what happened is in some of the states, Arizona, they tried to get that passed in a certain way so they could, could go past the election. That was rejected by the Ninth Circuit. In Pennsylvania, they tried to get it. It was not accepted, but a bunch of counties did it anyway. And that's where you had disparate treatment. So if you were in a Republican county 
and your ballot was rejected for any reason, you were not given an opportunity to cure. But if you were in a big Democratic county and your ballot was rejected, you were given an opportunity to cure. So you had a bunch of ballots count in one county that wouldn't have counted in the other. That's a classic equal protection violation. The question is whether the courts are going to do anything about it. Well, and now if I can stop you there also, one of the questions, and it's the one I think I've been hearing in the media, it's a it's it's only a few thousand ballots anyhow. It's under ten thousand ballots. The difference is so great that it won't it won't change anything. So why bother why bother remedying that deficiency, even if it is a bona fide deficiency? It's simple. My view is we got to fix these deficiencies now for future elections. So that that's where I believed and have encouraged people to take litigate legal efforts to reform the structure, you know, fix this now. Like people were asking about the runoff in Georgia. Well, I mean, given the debacle that was the November election, why does anyone think that the runoff is going to be anything other than uh, chaotic as well if we don't fix these problems now? So the, and not only that, if there was massive voter fraud, and then like, it, like we said, like I said at the earlier uh, in last week's live stream, there's a lot of uh, statistical evidence that it has indicia and badges of fraud uh, having occurred. Uh, this will be encouraging those people. They'll say, look, we got away with it. Uh, when, and you think they're going to stop? You know, they're going to increase it. So we need to build confidence in our elections. We have protocols and procedures constitutionally and by and by various blue ribbon commissions and independent bodies to, to utilize precisely for this circumstance. They are written for this. And we just need election officials to abide by it. And if they won't, we need courts to mandate they do. And if they still won't, then Congress has to step into the breach as the Constitution intended. Um, now, do I know whether that will happen? I think that's the uphill battle. The uphill battle is that, you know, is getting people to do their job, unfortunately, has been a hard